Greetings. In recent months, I have examined some of the real estate and construction data, and I've put forth videos on this channel about that, and how the Federal Reserve's quantitative easing program, because they only buy two things, U.S. Treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, distorts those two sectors and not others, and that is why the Federal Reserve's QE is particularly problematic in the way that it's being done. They should be doing the same or higher amount of dollars, but they should be giving cash directly to people rather than just buying treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. And we'll track another month's worth of this real estate and construction data because it is building up a bubble similar to 2007-2008. Not quite as extreme in some ways, but just as extreme in certain other ways. So to begin, we go back to my Atom publication and chapter 6. And within that, I scroll down. There's a section called the U.S. is in a real estate trap. And I want to read off this section. It's about this much, about one page if you were to print it out. Now, those of you who don't want to see this read through, just skip ahead about three minutes in this video. For those of you who want to see this read through and how it relates to what I'll talk about in the second part of this video, allow me to hide my face. The U.S. is in a real estate trap. Conventional wisdom has beatified the status of residential real estate as an absolute must for anyone who can remotely manage to purchase it, an asset class that somehow transcends mere financial properties to become an indicator of a person's self-worth. To question the sacred article of faith that a home always rises in value can get you socially blacklisted even after the 2008 real estate bust. Some of this stems from the fact that until a century ago, landowners were citizens with many special privileges such as voting rights unavailable to the landless. This made real estate the most visible demarcation of social class and even the basis of many surnames. Old beliefs are durable and even people who readily accept that commercial real estate is governed by the same economic fundamentals as other asset classes nonetheless insist that the addition of a kitchen and bathroom or bathrooms somehow exempts the property from the invisible hand of market forces. For this reason, residential homes have become deeply entangled in the politics of economic conditions and in turn with the Federal Reserve's monetary actions. Decades of marketing has manipulated the emotional aspect of home ownership to convince Americans that they own a house even if they have borrowed 80% or more of the price under relatively inclement legal terms. In reality, one only owns the dwelling they occupy if the mortgage payments are completed and 100% of the property is owned by the occupants. For if a mortgage house misses a couple of payments, the mortgage holder will soon discover how few ownership rights he truly has. Furthermore, most U.S. single-family homes are constructed from materials that deteriorate after about 50 years, a reality reflected in the tax code for commercial real estate depreciation schedules. This precludes the possibility of the structure itself rising in inherent value. In addition, non-payment of property taxes can lead to liens on a home and outright forfeiture, even if the amount owed is a small fraction of the home's value. Despite all this, the aura of emotion that surrounds home ownership endures. But as finance evolved, mortgages have become securitized, and bond yields are being managed by the Federal Reserve. Home prices generally rise and fall with the S&P 500, removing the perceived relative stability that real estate is believed to have, particularly if it is leveraged as most homes are. This means that real estate no longer represents diversification as a person's stock portfolio and home decline in value at the same time as when their employment is at higher risk. Both situations are exacerbated by insufficient NGDP as described earlier. In the meantime, the Federal Reserve, in lowering mortgage rates through the purchase of long-term treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, MBSs, is specifically seeking to inflate just one type of asset class and hope that it buoys the entire economy. The problem is, any action that increases home prices simultaneously triggers the construction of new homes, thus increasing supply. Hence, any government action to boost home prices is like trying to fill a sieve with water. Now that mortgage rates have been at historic lows for many years, often under 3% today versus 8% in the early 1990s, the one-time boost that home prices can get from rate declines is already incorporated. There's very little room for any further price gains from lowering of interest rates. Add to that the fact that property taxes are now as high as mortgage payments in many locations and the exhaustion of rate lowering as a technique to inflate home prices becomes even more obvious. Additionally, demographic factors are moving unfavorably towards housing. The imminent retirement of baby boomers and shortage of new first-time buyers due to a combination of youth unemployment 
exploding student loan debt, and a falling marriage rate means that sellers will outnumber buyers for the first time since data collection began in the late 1940s. Overseas buyers are not numerous enough to affect the total U.S. market as they concentrate on a handful of specific locations. This is a situation that has never before been seen in the United States since detailed data collection began in 1948. For these reasons, the current style of monetary policy is near the end of its efficacy. Under current trends, all housing-centric Federal Reserve action accumulates where it is needed the least, namely Silicon Valley and Manhattan, at the expense of the other 95% of the country's homes. No amount of further bond and MBS purchases by the Federal Reserve will be able to manage an orderly unwinding since those approaches are effectively of a fighting the previous war nature. Okay, this was written in 2016 with some very small updates in 2020. But now let's look at where construction data is actually trending and whether the Federal Reserve's practice of buying just treasuries and mortgage-backed securities and the latter being more relevant to this video, what exact situation does that cause? This is the calculated risk website and I scroll down to this chart over here, construction data. Now red is residential, blue is commercial private sector and orange is government. As we have seen throughout other videos on this channel, commercial private sector is under attack because not only is brick and mortar retail going to e-commerce as I discuss in this video up here, but office buildings are gonna be in a glut for years and years to come because of the telework revolution as I discuss in this video over here. Therefore, the construction industry can only grow from government spending and from the creation of new residential homes and the latter new residential homes being the primary source of growth for the industry. Now this is annualized dollars of construction spending and during the housing bubble, the build up to it, 2006, seven and eight, you saw that it got up to $675 billion and that this surge of 50% in just three years was what had created the bubble. There was a normal trend line and then there was a surge that required this much of a correction. So 50% surge in three years. Today, the dollars are more, but of course, this is not adjusted for the size of the economy. In terms of the size of GDP, this is still a lower peak than here in 2007, but it's higher in absolute dollars. And we have also seen about this 50% surge yet again, going from 500 billion up to about 775 billion. Now, all this low period over here was just kind of a correction of the excesses of the 2006, 7, 8 overbuilding and then things return to equilibrium, let's say 2014, 15, 16, but now the Federal Reserve has been doing so much quantitative easing of the mortgage-backed security purchasing type that it has stimulated more home construction. Home prices have risen because interest rates are down and home construction has to rise. Now remember, I say Fed funds rate has to be zero forever and that quantitative easing has to be permanent and exponentially rising. I'm saying it should be in the form of cash directly to people. I'm not one of those people who says the Fed funds rate should rise. I'm saying it should not rise and ultimately cannot rise because the market will force the Fed to lower it if the Fed tries to increase rates or even tries to taper QE. But this type of over-concentration of money printing into just one or two sectors obviously causes this problem. And we are on the verge of a similar type of housing bust type of situation again, particularly if they do the most ill-advised thing of all and raise interest rates on top of tapering off QE. Now mortgage debt is a significantly smaller percentage of GDP than it was during this housing bubble. At this time it was 70% of GDP. Now it's only 50% of GDP, but that's because of the Federal Reserve's intervention. More and more money leaks out of the Federal Reserve's quantitative easing to go into other sectors. For example, the tech industry attracts a lot of QE, even though the Federal Reserve does not print money in a way that directly goes to tech at all, they have figured out how to draw that in and other sectors are also figuring that out. Now here's another problem. One commenter brought up a couple months ago, he said that despite the amount of dollars being spent on new home construction, the number of housing starts is not very high, therefore it's not a problem. So let's look at that data. This is the Federal Reserve Board of Economic Research. And this is housing starts data, most recent. And as you can see, housing starts were unusually low in the recession following the 2006, seven, eight overbuilding. That makes sense but it's only recovered to this point over here. So in that sense, he's right. The number of housing starts is not high. It's very close to the long-term median, but there's two problems with that. 
even though the dollars were so much higher from what we saw in the previous chart, if the number of housing starts are so much lower, that means the housing start actually costs twice as much as it did in 2007. And find that was 14 years ago. Under rule of 72, that's about 5% a year annual increase. However, if housing starts are this expensive per start, that means that construction is still proving itself to be a low productivity sector. In fact, that's something I discuss in this video up here. But if a housing start costs twice as much as it did in 2007, when oil in fact has fallen by more than half since 2007, other commodities have fallen, this shows that the low productivity of the construction sector is causing inflation in that sector. Not enough to cause inflation in the whole economy, of course, but enough inflation in a relatively large sector that is going to attract technological disruption. Now, we've seen for over a decade a lot of these companies that try to create modular houses or 3D printed houses, but they never quite became cost effective or good enough to produce at volume. But now when the cost of a housing start is rising this much, there is more pressure for innovators to come in and create a low cost alternative. Second point, the Zoom revolution, the telework revolution has effectively relieved a large portion of the workforce from overpaying on housing only for the reasons of commute. You can pay for premium housing in a high prestige location or a location of great natural beauty or something, but a large portion of the expensive real estate in the United States is expensive only because it is near the high paying jobs and people who have those jobs have to commute and therefore have to live within a certain distance of the office. That is no longer true. I've done a lot of videos about this recently. This is one of the big disruptions going on in the world right now. And people can opt for low cost housing while still keeping their same jobs. And that process is already underway and is irreversible and is continuing to occur as these communication technologies like Zoom and other video conferencing solutions continue to get more and more advanced. In fact, many small towns that had depressed real estate because there were no local jobs anymore, they might be rescued just by people doing their jobs over Zoom when the headquarters is in another town, move to the small town, they find some super cheap housing, and I mean so cheap that it's almost free, you just have to do the maintenance, and can just live there. That is already also starting to happen. So for a housing start to cost this much is definitely behind the curve in terms of the adaptation of technology around this cost problem. And that's why the prospects of a housing bubble is definitely more than the housing starts number would appear to indicate. Because the inflation and low productivity is in the cost per start and therefore technological disruption can be attracted. The other problem is all these housing starts from decades ago was when baby boomers were first time home buyers. Fine. Baby boomers are now sellers. They are either retiring or dying off and so forth. And the replenishment is through immigration. Fine. However, the immigrant has to be kind of like-like with the baby boomer they are replacing in terms of income capacity. If a baby boomer who had a $3 million house in the Bay Area is selling their house, fine. There are a lot of skilled immigrants in the Bay Area from China, India, and so forth. But only a buyer of like-like income capacity can also buy that house at $3 million or even wants to. If the mix of the skill set of immigration is not of the same economic tier as it is of the people they're replacing, then an expensive housing start also doesn't fly because there are just not enough new buyers who are willing to pay that much when a housing start costs this much, which means the builder constructing the homes has to sell it at above that to make a profit. That's another factor to take into account. But anyway, this is a lot of data for this video, but something to think about. As residential construction spending continues to stay high, and it has to stay high because that's the only place that new construction is even needed in the United States, the low productivity of the industry, which has been going on for decades, might be seeing some accountability coming due because when costs are this high and there's this many different technological streams kind of attacking it from telework to the disruption of construction itself, you could see something happen that is quite dramatic. And it could be a down pricing of a lot of housing in the United States and the Federal Reserve will keep trying to buy mortgage-backed securities, but that won't work because as we saw in the beginning, that just stimulates the construction of new homes and people don't have to be physically located near their jobs anymore. So the location of the new homes also has a lot more flexibility. So quite a bit of food for thought. Now, if you like this type of content and you found this video informational, I encourage you to subscribe to this channel. Thank you very much for watching.